Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to break bread and we're going to do a Bible study on Psalm 119. That's the longest psalm in the uh, in, in all the book of Psalms. And think about David, King David. But before we do that, and it's all going to lead us to the Lord Jesus, um, I want to bring before the Lord all your prayer requests. And if I guess usually if I forget any of them, then you know that the Lord, the Lord knows them all. So let's uh, let's let, let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you for your Son and to thank you for the utter certainty of our salvation, of that great salvation that he died in order to achieve. And we pray that we might rejoice in it, that we might believe in your word of promise to us, that we shall at some point live and reign forever with him and with you and with each other. Heavenly Father, we pray for Silvana and for her family in this situation that has come upon them. We pray, Father, that you will give them wisdom and all your blessing. We pray, Father, that you'll be with John's mum to be able to sleep. We pray for unity in the right spirit and for strength, as Dan Louis said, for strength physically and in every way. Pray, Father, for your blessing upon all those who believe in you as their almighty God and who believe in your Son as their precious Saviour, that you will be with them and bless them. And we pray for Carl, the bobcat driver that Mark was telling us about, that you will lead him, Father, to, to salvation and to your dear Son. And Heavenly Father, we, we pray that you'll open our eyes to you and to the absolute reality that is in you and that we might live life not as this world and as the flesh lives it, but with a totally different perspective of you and of your kingdom. Please, Father, go with us and open our eyes now, as David would say, to behold wondrous things out of your law. For the Lord's sake. Amen. Right, well, Psalm 119, picking up where I left off last week, David, we are told, killed Goliath, and suddenly he becomes the hero of Israel. He'd been this shepherd boy, rejected by his older brothers, despised because he was a redhead, kicked out to look after their few sheep in the wilderness. And suddenly, he, well, he goes to take his brothers some food at the front line, and he sees Goliath, and he says, oh, yeah, I could kill him, no problem. And Saul, really, King Saul is the one who should really have killed him, but he didn't. And so David says, no, I don't need any armor. I'm good. I trust in God. Goes out with his uh, sling stone and kills Goliath. And suddenly he is catapulted to sort of rock star status in Israel. Suddenly he is the, the great popular guy. And the girls are all in love with him. And, oh, yeah, he's got to come and live in the court of Saul. And a very big change that suddenly came out of left field. A bit like Silvana getting news that at 44, you're pregnant. Um, this was suddenly out of left field. And we saw in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel last week that it's, it repeatedly says, David behaved himself very wisely. And it keeps on saying this, that he behaved himself wisely. Where did he get this wisdom from? He was an illiterate shepherd boy. Well, when you come to Psalm 119, it's this massive long psalm that in every verse, pretty well, of all 176 verses, it talks about God's word, his laws, his commandments. And David often says, I'm wiser than my enemies because I love your commandments, because I love your word. This clearly was where he got his wisdom from. But he was illiterate. I mean, literacy levels were very, very low in ancient societies, let alone for David, who was the kid brother. He had seven older brothers who clearly despised him, as you can see from how Eliab talks to him when he comes to the battlefront. He says, go back, you're just a kid. You're here just... just to see a fight, um, to see the battle. You go back and look after our few sheep that we've got in the wilderness. So he's despised, and yet he is the one who is used. And there he was, rejected, it seems, by his family, sent off into the desert to look after their few sheep. And what does he do? He thinks about God's word, and he memorizes it. 
And in this Psalm 119, which you really need to read, that can be your homework to read right through it in one go if you can, it's split into 22 sections, which are the 22 named after the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So it starts with the first eight verses, Aleph, A, as you'd say in English. The second eight verses are Beth, B, as you'd say in English, and so on. It doesn't stop there. Um, these are This is poetry, right? And so each line of each verse begins with that letter of the alphabet. For example, the first eight verses, Aleph, uh, in the section Aleph, each of those lines begins with a word that begins with A, or Aleph. And there's all sorts of other things uh, that, that you notice. The same words tend to occur um, within each line um, or, or each of those stanzas, those verses, those 22 eight-line verses. Um, they each repeat a word in lines one and seven. They repeat a word in lines two and six. They repeat a word in lines three and seven, four and eight, five and eight, and so on. In other words, this was designed to be memorized. And it is old school these days to talk about memorizing the Bible, memorizing verses, memory verses. This is all old school. Uh, but this is what spiritual life looks like to remember God's word and to recite it to yourself. And this is what David did. And I want to suggest that this psalm is written, was written, or composed, let's say, because I don't think David was literate at this point. It was written whilst he's on the run from Saul. There he is, catapulted to glory, and inevitably Saul gets jealous of him and starts persecuting him and tries to get him killed one way and another. And through all that, he is continually remembering God's word. Well, <clears throat> in most of these verses, or many of these verses in this long psalm, he says things like, my enemies are this and that, but I remember your word. He talks about his enemies, his, that rulers sit and judge me. The king is against me. Wicked people are against me. Enemies, plotters, opponents. They lay snares for me. Yeah, just like... Saul did, trying to get him married off to his daughter. And then Saul says, hey, give me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines as a dowry, thinking I will make him fall by the hand of the Philistines. They try to trap me. <clears throat> they insult me. They treat me unjustly. They dig pits for me. But, he always says, but I remember your word. <clears throat> I remember your law, etc." So it's written by someone who's under persecution, who remembers God's law and who is being chased all over the place. It, it clearly applies to David while he's on the run from Saul. And he says, I value your word more than all the silver and gold that they can offer. Well, yeah, there he was sort of in the palace life at one point in the court. No, I don't want all this wealth. No, I want to live by God's law. And he talks about how the people persecuting him abandon God's law, have broken God's law, don't keep God's law, don't care about God's law. Yeah, this is Saul and his his lot who are persecuting David. So that's the uh, that's the background. <clears throat> and if you read through it, you will see that yeah, this this most definitely is the is the context. This is David on the run from Saul, but he is always remembering God's, God's word, God's law, etc. Now, there's a few themes that I want to talk about. We can't possibly read through the whole, the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> first one is that <clears throat> when you read this, it appears that every verse talks about the, <clears throat> the word of God that he he says you know i'm persecuted but i keep your commandments i'm persecuted but i keep your statutes <clears throat> i love your law torah i love this i love that i love your promises i love your word 
And you can think at first blush that all those terms are just talking about the same thing, that your commandments, your statutes, your law, your, your requirements, your commands, your word, your promises, and it's all it's just different ways of talking about the same thing. But it, I suggest no. Yes, he does talk about his obedience to the law, as in the law of Moses. Yes, he does talk about that. But he talks specifically about God's word. And I want to suggest that that word that he's talking about is not the entire Bible. I mean, in David's time, as far as written scripture goes, he would have had the first five books, Moses, possibly Joshua, um, a bit of Judges, possibly, Job, maybe. Um, but he's not talking about the Bible. And he wasn't a literate man in any case. And the copies of the scriptures were not available. This is way back when David lived. <clears throat> so when he talks about specifically, not about your law, not about your commandments, but about your word, I suggest that what he's talking about is the word of God through Samuel that said, David, you are one day going to be king. You will one day be king of the kingdom. And one day Saul will die in battle and you will be king. And Samuel had anointed David in front of his brothers to prove that you are anointed. And that means that one day you will be the king of Israel. And Samuel, in 1 Samuel 15, when he tells Saul this, you know, God's rejected you, Saul, you're as king, you're not going to be king, but David is or another man is going to be king. Samuel says to him, hear the word of the Lord. This is God's word. And so I suggest that when you read in this long psalm about the word, I'm not talking about the law, the commandments, the statutes, etc., but about the word of God, David is talking about the word of promise that I will be in God's kingdom, that I will be a king in glory one day. Here I am, chased like a dog around the desert by Saul, betrayed, hated, slandered by Saul and his gang. But God's word to me is that one day this will change. One day this will not be like this, and one day... Saul will be dead, and I, believe it or not, will be king. doesn't seem likely. That's why he says things like, judge my enemies according to your word. What word? The word that Saul was going to die one day in battle, which he did. And when he keeps saying, fulfill your word to me, your servant, fulfill your promise, when are you going to fulfill your word to me? He's not talking about the whole Bible. He's talking about specifically the word of promise that he would be in God's kingdom and would one day reign in glory. When it seemed that everything was against him, that people were siding with Saul whenever he turned up in an area in, of the desert, the people all thought, oh, that's David. And some of them go and tell Saul. And Saul comes charging after him to try and kill him. People betray him. People are ungrateful what he does for them, etc. And so he obviously does have a lot of uh, depression and stress. And this psalm is talking about how he is comforted in that by God's word. And yes, you can say, well, yes, read your Bible and you'll get comforted. Yeah, I'm not saying don't. Uh, but specifically here, that word that is his comfort, he says, your, your word is my comfort in all my affliction, is the word that one day I will be king. And he keeps saying, how long will it be until your word is fulfilled? It's clearly, he says that often, it is clearly the word specifically, the word of promise that he would be in God's kingdom. And he says, or oh, a load of times in this psalm, in the middle of the night, I meditate on your word. It doesn't mean that he, he was, I don't think it means that he was going through the law of Moses in his mind, wondering what that means and this, that and the other. No, in the middle of the night, he woke up thinking, yeah, God's word is that one day I am sleeping under a bush, sleeping on the street sort of thing. And one day I will be in God's kingdom. 
And he says, I wake up in the morning. I even get up before the dawn and I'm thinking about your word. Now, of course, this all applies to us because Paul says, he who has anointed us is God, who has given us of his spirit. We have been anointed. We are in Christ, and Christ means the anointed one, by baptism into him. We are anointed. John talks about the anointing which you have received abides in you. This is, as Paul would say, the guarantee, the earnest of our inheritance, that we have received his spirit. We have been anointed. And if you're anointed, it doesn't mean you are a king. <clears throat> it means that you're going to be a king, just like with um, with David, that he was uh, anointed, but he wasn't yet king. He was going to be king in the future. And so this is how it is with us. We have this eternity in front of us, and this life is just so tiny, just very short. One millimeter compared to the eternal long line of God's kingdom. And so he got up in the middle of the night thinking about this word of promise, and he woke up in the morning thinking about it. And he says, I promise I will not forget your word. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to keep memorizing it. I'm saying that that is not off the, out of the picture. But he's saying that I will remember that you've promised, that I one day will be in God's kingdom. So whatever we go through, be it death itself, be it unexpected pregnancy, be it illness, death, whatever hits us out of left field, I will remember your word that one day I will be there. And he often says, you know, I feel like dying. I feel I'm almost dead. He says, I'm weary with sorrow, but I am revived by your word. Now, that doesn't mean that there you are in depression there you are feeling dead in the dust, as he says, and oh, I open the Bible, oh, and now I feel happy. Yeah, I'm not saying don't open your Bible and read your Bible. Of course, do it. That's what I do, and I encourage you to do it. But in the context here, he's saying that, yeah, there I am. I feel dead. I feel like I'm a dead dog, as he says to Saul. What are you chasing me around the desert for? I'm just a flea. I'm nothing. So if felt pretty bad about himself but then he says you revive me by your word in other words by the promise of your kingdom then you come to a verse that is very well known that is on a lot of uh, bible bookmarks and and, and and stuff your word is a light to my path and a lamp to my feet a light to my path and a lamp to my feet well i think what it's saying is that my moment-by-moment moment steps in life are guided by your word. It's a lamp to my feet, and it's a light to my path in the overall bigger picture, the path I take in life. Your word is the light. What does this mean? Does it mean that the Bible is our guide? Well, yes, the Bible is our guide, but I'm saying that the word specifically is the word of promise that I will be in God's kingdom. I will reign forever in glory. It seems there's too much of a disconnect between me, little me now in this crazy life, and that eternal weight of glory. But he keeps on reminding himself, and his path in life is guided by that word, by that knowledge that I shall be saved. He says, my enemies and specifically my adversary, which is King Saul, forgets your word. Yeah, Saul had been told by Samuel this word, that David basically is going to be king and you are not going to be king. But he forgot all about that. He thought, no, no, hang that. I, I'm going to kill David. Stop this prophecy coming true. But David keeps saying, your word is true. Your word is true. And yes, the Bible is true, but... I'm saying that the word is specifically the word of promise, the word of promise that I will be eternally saved, and this life shall be as a moment, as a as a second, as a nanosecond. Yeah, that is true. And he says, I'm in awe of your word. And he says, your word sort of governs my whole understanding of life. 
that if actually this life is just a moment, well, that, and I'm going to live eternally, well, yeah, that does guide your view of yourself in this world. Uh, if you've only got this life, and that's all you see, you've got no eternal perspective, then, yeah, if life, if you don't make loads of money, if you don't have good health, if you don't have a fantastic family, and an amazing, awesome family life, and you'll go on holiday with unlimited spending money and all that stuff. Oh, well, you didn't, life didn't work out. Oh, life wasn't any good. I failed. Well, everybody fails, right? <laughs> everybody fails in uh, on those metrics. Um, nobody's living the dream. This is <laughs> nonsense. Nobody's living the dream. But for us, it's all different because your word guides my path your word is true and your word gives me great understanding yes because now i get it that this life whether i am successful or not in worldly terms is but for a second is but for a moment compared to that eternal weight of glory now <clears throat> david often talks about how i am slandered i am slandered yeah, Saul had run a slander campaign against David, and it hurt. To be wrongly spoken about or reproached, as he says, is painful. But he says, I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, that Saul, because I trust in your word. Yeah, this word is going to come true. One day I shall be king, and you, Saul, shall be dead, because you will die in battle. And that will be my answer to your reproach. And this is the whole thing, that if we believe in that word of promise, then you see it, that this too shall pass, this life shall pass, whatever, death itself, cancer, whatever it might be, illness unto death, terminal illness, this too, in the end, shall pass, because this is only a moment. He says, princes persecuted me without a cause. Well, that's definitely Saul and his gang. They persecuted David without a cause. But my heart stands in awe of your word. Yeah, there they are being horrible to me. But I'm just in awe that I am going to live eternally. And not only live eternally, exist eternally, but reign and be in God's kingdom. Your word revi revives me. <laughs> so, do good to your servant according to your word. My eyes fail for the fulfillment of your word. I say, when will you comfort me? When will you execute your word on those who persecute me? Yeah, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. That's the equivalent that it translates into for us. I can't wait for all this drama to be over. And your word for me shall be fulfilled. He says, let your grace be for my comfort, according to your word, to your servant. So again, your word is your word to me, David, your servant, that he would be the king, the kingdom. And he says, so let your grace come to me. He sees his being chosen as being the future king uh, as by grace alone. So he says, establish my footsteps in your word. Don't let any sin have dominion over me. So he says, because of your word of promise to me, set my footsteps up guide my path and then he says things like your word is settled forever by your word you created everything and it's that same amazing word of god to me your servant that i will live forever that i will be your king as you have said and then he says i rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil as one who finds treasure and the lord jesus picks that up and he says that the man who finds treasure and rejoices greatly is the man who finds the kingdom is the man who finds the kingdom of god so when he says david says i rejoice at your word like a man who finds great treasure sort of in a field as it were well your word yeah is the word of the kingdom how sweet are your promises to my taste more than honey to my mouth how wonderful it is that I am going to be king. Now, I said that 
at times in the psalm, he, he is talking about the Torah, that is the um, specific commandments of the Lord of Moses, possibly specifically he has in view the Ten Commandments. But the word Torah, which simply means teaching, uh, this was used, and it is used in the Bible the book of Genesis, well before the law of Moses was certainly written down, codified as the Torah, as we now know it. So even that word Torah doesn't have to mean the Torah as Jews talk about it, or the five books of Moses. It doesn't have to mean that. Well, obviously it doesn't have to mean that because it's used uh, before those books were even written uh, in the book of Genesis. So it also means, Torah means like teaching, the word of God, teaching, simple as that. So even some of those times when he talks about your Torah, when he says, I meditate on your word, I put my hope in your word, um, great peace have they who love your Torah, uh, your Torah is my meditation all the day, he could still be having in view, not necessarily all the commands about you know, how to offer sacrifices and what the priests have got to do and mustn't do. But simply, I have this word from you, this teaching from you, that I shall be king in your kingdom. And great peace have those who love that, that word. He says, let my tongue sing of your word. Well, of course, he wasn't always like this because, you know, we're told that... Um, when the Philistines, when he runs away to the Philistines, when he has a bad moment, and the Philistines say, huh, this is David who killed loads of us. Oh, it looks like they're going to uh, come and kill him. It says David laid up the words of the Philistines in his heart. But then here in Psalm 119, he says, I, I lay up your word in my heart. So there he was repeating to himself, the words of these other guys but then he gets himself back on track and there's a lot of examples of that in psalm 119 of him sort of in his self-talk almost persuading himself of god's word the word of promise i will lay up that word in my heart not the words of those people threatening me those people who are slandering me but i will lay up your word in my heart and it's very easy or particularly bad at this, of remembering the words of people, either nasty words or false words or threatening words that worry you and upset you and keep on churning those words in your mind. David did this. But then here in the psalm, he says, no, no, your word, the word that I, by your grace, will be in your kingdom, that's what I will lay up in my heart. Well, there's another theme a bit related to this, really. Um, that you 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 get very much in this psalm, and he it's that in some verses David says, "I keep your word, I keep your commandment, I am obedient to your commandments, I do your your word." But then he also often says, "Oh, tears run down my my cheeks because I don't keep your your word because I don't obey your commandments." Make me obedient, because I'm not obedient. And the psalm finishes, apparently strangely, when in the last verse, where he says, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Please seek me. Bring me back. So in some verses, he's saying, I keep your word. I keep it. I do not forget your word. In other words, in other verses, he's saying, oh, but I keep disobeying you. I'm not as obedient. Oh, please forgive me. And Help me to be more obedient. And I think you can put them together. What he's saying is, yes, I am not obedient. And I cry with tears that I am not obedient. And that's a challenge. I can't say that I cry because I'm not obedient not very often. Um, but, you know, this is part of spiritual life. Oh, forgive me wretched man that i am on one hand but on the other hand he's saying no, no i've kept your your word i keep your commandments and he's alluding there to um you know the deuteronomy passages about keeping the covenant 
he's saying, I think, that although I fail, I definitely keep your covenant. I am abiding in that covenant relationship. And I believe your word, the word of promise, that I shall be king and I rejoice in it. Oh, yeah, but then tears run down my cheeks because I'm disobedient to your laws. Yeah, the two things don't contradict. You can be confident of salvation by grace, confident that you are saved and that you're in covenant. And you see, this is why we take the cup of the new covenant. We take the cup of the covenant to remind ourselves that I really am in covenant relationship with God and with his dear son. Yes, I have no doubt I'm in covenant relationship and I will be saved. But on the other hand, David is saying, yeah, but I, I, I am confident of that, but I keep failing you. I keep disobeying your law and getting distracted and going astray like a lost sheep. And that is helpful because if you don't get that thing about covenant relationship, you can tend to think, oh dear, I'm, I'm not totally obedient. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, I'm lost. I can't, uh, oh, I can't do this. No, not at all. Um, the other theme, another theme I see here is when he keeps saying, make me obedient. He says things like, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. In multiple verses here, he says, bring me back to your word. He says, you, God, do something to my mind. Open my eyes, the eyes of my understanding, that I might understand. Teach me, he's saying, teach me your law. Tell me what this means. Explain to me, give me understanding. And all those verses, and there are very many of them in this psalm, they all demonstrate for sure that God is not facing off against man over an open Bible, saying, look, I've given you my son, I've given you my word, the Bible, and get on and read it and understand it, and you will find me. God is way more proactive than that. He is opening eyes, he is turning hearts, he is giving understanding. You see, if it's all about our own unaided sort of Bible reading, well, not that David was a Bible reader because he was illiterate. Um, it all becomes very academic and intellectual, and the, the race is won by those who have the most academic mind and those who have access to God's word. The race is won by the most literate, by those who maybe know something of the original languages, uh, the Bible was written in those who can do mental gymnastics with scripture, those who've got enough IQ to be able to do that. And anybody else is not going to make it. That's the view of a lot of denominations who are dogmatic on and on about dogma, about doctrine and so on. That can't be the case because the gospel is for the simple. Um, absolutely. And the illiterate and the low IQ folks. Absolutely. So it's not about. And he keeps asking God to do something to him. Open my eyes. Turn away my eyes, he says, from beholding vain things, which I, you could apply that in our day to uh, stuff on your screen. Uh, but the original reference, I'm sure, was to vain things as in idols turn my eyes away from that and turn my eyes towards your word. So there is this big desire in him for God to work on him psychologically. And that's what we need to have. And that desire for God to do something to my mind, over and above my reading, if you like, of the text of the Bible, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And some people shy right away from that in total denial. Oh, no, just read your Bible, right? Mm, that's, yes, <laughs> I'm not saying don't read your Bible, but I'm saying that you've got to have the spirit of David that says, open my eyes, turn away my eyes from looking over there to looking to you. Give me understanding. Show me what this means. And that's why he says, I am wiser than my teachers. I'm wiser than the elders. Yes, because what God teaches you directly 
is way, way deeper than whatever you might learn from a teacher, a pastor, a YouTube video, a Zoom meeting, some guy explaining something to you. So there you have it, to pray to God, to work on your mind, to open the eyes of your understanding. And he will do this through his spirit. But if you're resistant to the idea of the Holy Spirit working in the human heart today, I'm not talking about miracles, I'm talking about his spirit working in your spirit, which is the undoubted promise of many verses in the New Testament. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. God works through his spirit with all his might in the inner man. We have been given the earnest or the guarantee of the spirit in our hearts, in our minds. So the arena of the spirit's operation is the human mind, it's the human heart. Um, you can really see that clearly. And, and that is the gift. That is what is on offer. That is what God wants to give you. Well, my last uh, little theme I want to pick up is that multiple times in the psalm, he says, save me from shame because I believe in your word. And I, I thought about that all week. I've been reading and rereading this psalm, and it is a major theme. It saved me from shame. I believe in your word, so sh save me from shame. Now, what, what's this young guy got to be ashamed about? You know, did he commit some sin when he was a real youngster? Or, you know, get his girlfriend pregnant, or whatever. So, was he worried about all that coming out? Uh, possibly, but I don't think so I think it, it, it doesn't feel like that to me so i thought a bit more about this and he talks about those who taunt me those who utterly deride me those who mock me but i trust in your word what were they taunting david about what were they mocking him about what were they deriding him about he was you know handsome young fellow who'd killed Goliath, why were they mocking him and deriding him and taunting him? And why was he so frightened of shame? Well, remember what we said in the last few weeks going through the life of David, that he was the youngest of those brothers, and he was sort of kicked out by them. And he was out in the wilderness looking after their few sheep. He says, when he sins with Bathsheba, he says, in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. And that is taken by some people, quite a lot of people actually, to sort of mean that when a woman conceives, oh, this is a sin because like, you know, she had sex and all that to get pregnant. And well, human beings are so sinful that, yeah, it's a pretty big sin to conceive yet another one of the terrible little things. That's rubbish. I mean, straight out, I'll tell you, that, that's absolute nonsense. That, that, that is nonsense. And from Catholicism to Protestantism, you, you go, a lot of people believe that. So what does he mean when he says, in sin did my mother conceive me? Well, why don't I just read it <laughs> as is? In sin, my mother conceived me. Yeah, I was born out of wedlock. Um, yeah, my father had a fling with some, some woman, and she conceived me in sin. Straight up, just take it as is. And if you go through the genealogy of David that you've got at the end of the book of Ruth, you will see that David was a descendant of Ruth, who was from Moab. She was a Moabitess. She was not an Israelite. And we've been saying that David had red hair, and because of his red hair, he was despised. And I said that we tend to think red hair is, is a cute thing for a kid to have, not for them. How many Middle Eastern types do you know have got red hair? I guess none. <laughs> it's very odd that he should be, King James calls ruddy or red-headed. Even Goliath despises him, and when he sees that he's red-headed, he despises him. Yeah. 
Well, putting it all together, yeah, he was, David was illeg illegitimate because he says, in sin my mother conceived me. And that's why he was rejected by his older brothers, kicked off to look after their sheep in the wilderness. And he was not fully Hebrew. He was mixed race. He was a bit of a Moabite. Now in the book of Judges, you read about two judges of Israel called Jephthah and Abimelech. And both of those guys were sons of prostitutes. And because they were sons of prostitutes, Israel didn't want them to be their leaders. And you start to put the scriptures together and you get it. That, yeah, he was ashamed, he was scared that it's all going to come out that my mum was a whore and that I'm illegitimate and that I'm, a, I'm descended from a Moabite. Because in Deuteronomy 23, it says that a Moabite could not enter the congregation of Israel for 10 generations, and that could mean forever. But anyway, and it was less than 10 generations going back to uh, Ruth. Deuteronomy 23 also says <clears throat> that an illegitimate child, one of illegitimate birth, shall not enter the assembly of Yahweh even to the 10th generation. Well, he was illegitimate. He says that, in sin did my mother conceive me. Forget all these fanciful theories about sinful human nature and all this rubbish. Sorry, but it is. In sin did my mother conceive me. It is not a sin for a woman to conceive a child. Come on. God doesn't hate fetuses in the womb, thinking, ah, there's another of those sinful people. The sex within marriage is not a sin. The bed is undefiled, as Paul says. No, this, this is all nonsense. Um, in sin did my mother conceive me means what it says. That in sin my mother conceived me. What it says. So he was illegitimate. He couldn't enter the congregation of Israel for 10 generations. Plus he had a double whammy because he was also descended from Ruth the Moabites. Couldn't enter the congregation for 10 generations. Yeah. This is what they were taunting him about. Oh, you're going to be king, are you? Ha ha, you're not even a proper Israelite. You're not even in the congregation of Yahweh. You are illegitimate. And actually, all this is brought together in Psalm 69, verse 8, where he says that I was an alien and a stranger to my brothers. I was an alien to my brothers. Yeah, they, they didn't consider me to be true Hebrew. I wasn't true blue. I was mixed race i was an alien to my brothers and a stranger and what is that word stranger well it's related to the hebrew word for bastard or illegitimate and actually mum said in not just in hebrew but i understand in arabic as well not that i know arabic but so i'm told uh, that is a kind of a cuss word, as the word bastard might be used in certain contexts uh, as a curse word in, in English. So he says, I was an alien to my brothers. Yes, I was a, a Gentile. They didn't accept me because uh, they were only my half brothers. And yeah, I was a stranger. I was, uh, mum said, I was, a, I was a, a, an illegitimate one. That's how they considered me. That's why, you see, when Jesse comes before Samuel, and Samuel basically says, I'm going to anoint one of your sons to be king, uh, bring your sons before me. Well, he brings all his sons before him, and Samuel says, no, have you got any other sons? And Jesse comes and kind of gets a bit awkward. He doesn't say, yes, I do. He says, well, there's David. The little one. Um, yeah, there's David, but he's, he's out in the wilderness looking after the sheep. He sort of sense Jesse's a bit awkward. You know, before the man of God, he's asked, do you have any other sons? Um, <clears throat> there's the little one, David. Yeah, little kid sort of thing, the youngster. Yeah, yeah, but he's, he's just looking after the sheep. Ah, yeah. So... David was the absolute outsider. And if you feel that you're the outsider, that you've got everything against you, 
You see, this is the point of understanding that the word in Psalm 119 is the word of promise. He says, for example, let me not be ashamed of my hope, or as the Septuagint says, of my expectation. Yeah, my hope is to be the king of Israel, but I've got everything against me. Uh, I'm not supposed to be, because I'm not a true Hebrew, I'm not a full-blooded Hebrew, and I'm illegitimate. Then I'm the, the son of a whore. And, well, uh, yeah, Jephthah and Abimelech, they were accepted as judges of Israel because because they were the sons of whores, and um, <clears throat> so am I. And this is what he was being taunted about. This is why he says, my enemy taunts me, but I trust in your word. See, it all makes sense. They they deride me. They mock me. You, who was your mother? Dave? Hey, Dave, who was your mum? Huh? Yeah. You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see it all. But he says, but I trust in your word. And so there we all are, all of us here, to one degree or another, we are all outsiders. We are all losers in the eyes of the world. We have all got stuff. But I will trust in your word, the word of promise that I will live eternally in your kingdom. I will think about that. I'll wake up at night thinking about it. I will sing about it. I will think about it in the morning when I wake up. And no matter what, I believe in this word. And that word is true from the beginning. And it's as settled in heaven as anything. It's going to come true. And so here you have it. We're going to break bread now and take the cup of the covenant to show that I am in covenant. Sure, I break God's laws. I do not follow as I should. I am not as I would wish to be. But I am in covenant with God and for sure, we shall be kings and priests, Revelation 5.10, and we shall reign on the earth. There is before us that far more eternal weight of glory in front of us. And that is what binds us together. And as David also says in Psalm 119, let all those who love your word, who believe in your word, let them come to me. Yes. And we are those people who have come to him. So <clears throat> his death in the way that it was and is, is there to, I think, assure us, to persuade us that I really will be saved. And this is what it is. You know, when, when I baptize someone, I say to them, do you believe the things about the kingdom of God? And I don't mean, <clears throat> do you understand well, sure, they understand that's why they're being baptized. But do you believe that? Do you believe that you will live forever? Now, like David, I can say, yes, I do. But, yeah, tears in my eyes that I don't live as I should. I don't mean I'm, I'm super hypocrite or something, but I just know that I, I am not as I would like to be. Oh, why not be? I don't have any massive secret <laughs> sinful life going on. No. But I am not as I would like to be. I see God's laws, God's standards, and I'm not that man that I would like to be. But I'm not. But, okay, but then I rejoice in your word. I rejoice in your word that you know, I will be there. And it's a very long bridge between me here in Croydon and that eternity, that glory. It's a very big bridge. It's a very big disconnect. It's a very long journey but that is what faith is trust that actually it will be so well <clears throat> let's take the bread as the symbol of the body of our lord jesus christ and i wonder um oh, oh, i wonder dan Mui, could you pray for the bread Let's give thanks for the bread. <clears throat> Our dearest Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We come before you to remember and focus our minds to the magnificent achievement of our Lord Jesus in how he sacrificed and the value of his life affects each and every one of us in a very profound way that 
we look at ourselves and see how unworthy we are in every way. And that your grace alone through your son is the basis of our salvation. Here we are believing in your salvation and all your promises, putting our hope in the faith of our Lord Jesus, that you will see us through his eyes and that you will identify us with him in his death and his resurrection. Father, please open our eyes to truly see beyond ink and letter and soften our hearts and give us the spirit of change and humility so that your word may become alive in our everyday lives in the sense that we should be thriving, living and breathing in the promises of your word that all is true now and it's true in its fulfillment in your kingdom. Father, this bread represents the perfect body of our Lord Jesus and his sacrificed life that was given to redeem us. Strengthen us, Father, to yield our lives to Jesus, our Lord, and to honor our covenant relationship with you and your son. In his name. Amen. Amen. So we take the cup of the covenant. I am in covenant with him. <clears throat> Failure, yes, but I'm in covenant with him, no doubt. Absolutely. Uh, Phil, would you like to uh, give thanks for the cup? Sure. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are reminded that it was by the power of your word that you created this vast universe and allowed us to be living in it. And Father, we know that you have had your eye on us from the beginning. Incredible though that may seem to us as human beings. And you've proved that by giving your son, the Lord Jesus, for each one of us individually, because you want us individually and as a group to be members of your kingdom, to live endlessly, to grant us immortality, to be with you personally and with the Lord Jesus forevermore. This is something which is almost beyond our comprehension, but we believe your word, we accept it, and we ask that we may be strengthened as we dwell upon it. So we thank you now for this wine which is so representative of his life poured out for us to enable all this to come to fruition thank you so much in jesus name amen amen so this is the cup of the new covenant <clears throat> 